Come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord who is our great and glorious God. Welcome to Treasure Lake Church today. Thank you that we get a chance to spend some time together. Thank you that we'll be praying together, that we'll look to God and say, teach us. We want to hear your words, and Lord, we want to know you. We want to worship you. We want to touch your glory and admire you with all that we are. It's part of our calling, and we're glad to do that together. Today as we seek the Lord and as we pray, there are all sorts of prayer requests that are important to us and to this community. We encourage you to send us your prayer requests so that we can be praying with you as well. Today we want to continue to pray for Beth and Mason, Carter, Pat, Megan, Ezra, Illinois, Lexi, Penn, and Bob who are fighting with cancer that they would recover and recover fully. We want to pray that uh, God in his grace would take care of Denise who has COVID and is fighting some complications and it's affecting her greatly. We want to pray for little James Minor that he'll recover from flu symptoms and that he'll be strong. We want to pray that Sharon will recover from her surgery and that Rose who's getting very close to her 100th birthday would be strong and be able to have a wonderful 100th birthday celebration. She spent some time in in the ER recently. We're asking that God would heal her and intervene. I want to pray that God would bless greatly the family day at the park that's upcoming and that the name of Jesus would be lifted high. I want to pray that as we meet together for church in the park that it would be a great time of unity and encouragement because we have brothers and sisters that, well, we haven't met, but they're here in the Dubois area and it'll just be good to worship together. We want to pray that the Lord would uh, send special blessings to us here in Dubois. I want to pray that he works all around the world and that he intervenes in trouble spots like Ukraine and that his grace would be heard and that churches would grow in places like Burkina Faso. I want to pray for the work of God. Let's take some time to pray. Father God, on this day we bring ourselves to you and we thank you that we know you and we thank you that you hear our prayers. We ask, Heavenly Father, that we draw ourselves close to you, Spirit. Teach us to walk and listen in the presence of God Almighty. Father, we come to you with our prayer request and we do ask that you would heal and take away everything that's attached to cancer in the lives of Beth and Carter, Mason, Pat, Megan, Ezra, Eleanor, Lexi, Penn, and Bob. Father God, we pray that you give them encouraging weeks and take them to the other side of cancer. Lord, I want to pray for Denise who has COVID, and we pray that uh, with other complications that you will particularly make those symptoms short-lived and that you would restore the health that uh, would be their pleasure. Father God, we want to ask that you would bless Rose and that Rose would get stronger and that her 100th birthday would be a great celebration. We pray that Sharon's recovery from surgery will go very well and that little James, you will strengthen. We ask you, Heavenly Father, that uh, come family day in the park, that uh, we would have great weather and a great opportunity to lift up the name of Jesus. We pray that Christ, your name, is heard and that many people are influenced by what takes place in the park. We pray that church in the park would be a wonderful occasion for us to smile and greet and encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we pray that you do give us unity and that we would seek that and that we would be cautious about things that uh, bring disunity. Heavenly Father, as we worship you today, we pray that we would hear your voice. We pray that your name is lifted up. Father God, we pray that you would move us as we need to be moved. We trust you fully. Increase our faith, our hope, and our love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey church family, I don't know about you, but I'm still reflecting on God's monumental love for us. He is an awesome God who prepares great things for his kids. I'm looking forward to our August calendar and I love what I see. Tuesday, August 9th, we are serving our community by hosting a blood drive. The hours are from 1 to 7 p.m. Your donations will save lives. This week, we are collecting clothing for a local charity called We Care for Kids. Their mission is to give local children from kindergarten to 12th grade the basic necessities that so many of us take for granted. From August 6th to the 14th, they are doing a back to school drive for new or gently used items such as youth and adult sized hoodies, backpacks, shorts, sweatpants, and leggings in adult sizes, new socks and underwear, and travel sized toiletries. For any questions, contact Danielle Kinnar. On Thursday, August 11th, there is a volunteer meeting for Family Day at the Park and Church in the Park. It starts at 6 p.m. at the United Methodist Church on Long Avenue. Come help us prepare to deliver a great big blessing to Du Bois. Sunday, August 21st, we'll have a picnic after our 11 a.m. service. This is going to be a special day because our picnic will be combined with a baptism. Perhaps you've been thinking about baptism. It's a wonderful declaration of our faith. Jesus is our Savior, and we trust in Him and Him alone. Hey y'all, I'm Kevin Hollander, and last year I was baptized here at this beach. The reason that I decided to get baptized was when I first started out in life, I was baptized as a baby in the Catholic Church. When I joined the military, I lost all my faith. And when I met Brittany, she decided to take me down to the right path, and we started going to church again, hear more and more, and then I was listening to a podcast, the Unashamed Podcast with the Robertsons, uh, who do Duck Dynasty. And Phil Robertson mentioned that if you are not leading your family in Christ, what are you doing as that father figure? And that just struck me at that moment to be like, I need to get my priorities straight. I need to lead my family in faith. But then I also wanted to give my life to Christ. And that is the reason why I decided to get baptized here. If you are interested in being baptized, please contact Pastor Dave. Our picnic and baptism take place at New Providence Beach. We've got a big finish to the month. Family day at the park is going to be great. Activities for kids, time to connect, a wonderful Christian concert in the evening with the Alan Scott Band and Tasha Layton. And that all happens on Saturday, August 27th. Then on Sunday, August 28th, we have Church in the Park. Many of the churches in Dubois are gathering for a combined worship service, and it's going to be great. Let's pray that God will touch many hearts and generate greater unity among believers here in Dubois. If this is your first time with us, we welcome you. Please find the welcome card in the pew in front of you, fill it out, and place it in the offering plate on your way out of the sanctuary. We all follow a king. We all live in a kingdom. And for most of us, it's the kingdom of me. In this kingdom, we rule and reign. Reputation, success, power, comfort, and relationships sit on the throne of our hearts, influencing our actions and ruling our lives. In the kingdom of me, the outcome is always the same. Life is marked by foolishness and frustration. Failure follows failure and relationships are broken as our selfish aims consume us. Until Jesus. Jesus announced the arrival of a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. Jesus marks the reign of a new king. This king does more than ruling from the throne. He rules in your very heart. But this king is different. As you follow this new king, he radically changes your heart, orienting you to life in his kingdom. Under his reign, selfishness gives way to generosity. Cries of self-reliance become cries of dependent prayer. Bitterness is replaced by forgiveness, and anxiety and fear evaporate in the light of the king's love.
and clear. We have a new king. We have a new kingdom. The kingdom of God is replacing the kingdom of me. The good and the bad, the right and the wrong. I think that most of us are pretty happy when we feel like we're in a situation where the good is just so clear or the evil is so obvious because when you see something like that, it's real easy to make the decision. You see, on any occasion in which everything just seems to be the way that it should, it's so easy to embrace it and to praise it. Or you're in a different situation, it seems like everything goes exactly the opposite of what it should be. It's easy to condemn it, but, but there's times when it's not quite so easy to make a judgment because it seems like between the good and the bad, we might feel like we're bumping into the messy middle. There's a little bit of both that's all wrapped up together, so you have a friend that you like. And man, if you're just talking about your relationship with that person, um, there's a lot that's good that you can compliment and say, I really appreciate that person. But, but what you know is true is each time that person brings up their parents, what they say and their attitude is just so toxic and over the top. You just can't quite say that all of that is good the way that it should. There's somebody else that you would say, well, I enjoy them so much. I mean, being together is good as long as one thing happens. And uh, that's that we agree together because when that person doesn't agree with somebody, wow, they become so combative and harsh. And the words that come out of their mouth, they're excessive as well. And, and so in one situation, it's quite comfortable and good to be with them. And in another, it's quite awkward. There's a messy middle that exists. And what I think is that life has a whole lot of the messy middle that leaves us with a question, so what are we going to do about that? I think that if we were to fail to talk about the messy middle and the complexity of this life that has a, well, we call it a mixed bag of, of good and bad, if, if we don't talk about that complexity, we're not prepared to live through it. If we're not ready to talk with our kids about what it is to navigate through this messy middle, we will find that they are unprepared for life today as we look to our text we're going to be looking at something that is a bit of a mixed bag. It's not that a mixed bag is something that uh, we find elsewhere. I think that we can find a mixed bag even when we're here at church. There may be somebody that you know that in as much as that person is a person of prayer, you admire that person. But over the years as you've gotten to know that person, they don't just pray a lot. You also find that they are rather angry in the core of who they are and they express so much discontentment and all of those things get wrapped up together in the same life. And honestly, if that person had been a prayer person and had been full of peace, that would have made sense. Or if that person hadn't prayed at all and was full of anger, that might be a little easier to interpret. But what you find is that there is that combination of the two that you just wouldn't expect and it becomes a bit complicated. And so today we're looking at a story that's going to portray that we're confronted by a mixed bag of good and bad and it complicates our lives and our decision making as it will complicate the life of David. And so as we move through the book of 2 Samuel, we've come to the third chapter and the third chapter has a first verse which reads this way and the war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker father God we want to ask that you help us to grasp this story and I think that in as much as it reflects something that we bump into a whole lot Lord show us how to wisely with discernment work with people who are a mixed bag. And Father, in as much as we are mixed bags ourselves, we pray that you would work in us and purify us and make us more like Jesus. We ask these things in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Verse 1 in chapter 3, it's really a summary statement. Um, 
Time had been passing, and during this time, the house of Saul and the house of David, well, they had been at war, and, and there was a trend that was going on. David was getting stronger, and the house of Saul was getting weaker. And we know that this is describing a time that went on for some length of time. In fact, verses 2 through 5, it describes how during this time, while David was in Hebron, and there was this conflict, and David was growing stronger, David actually had six children during that time period. So this isn't just a couple months. This had been going on and there's an ascendancy of David and there is a weakening of the house of Saul. And that whole scenario of there being two houses, well, that's a phenomena in and of itself. Because what we see is that God Almighty had promised that the throne would be given to David, his chosen one. But in chapter 2, the throne didn't just go to David. There was this guy by the name of Abner. And Abner uses his influence to install someone else over most of the tribes of Israel. Eleven of them are being led by Esbosheth, and Abner is the one, chapter 2, who sort of made that happen. And so I think that we should be asking ourselves the question, well, who is this guy Abner? Because he's going to be a key player in chapter 3. And just seeing what he did in chapter 2, that, that he went against God's call and direction that David should be the king, and he decided to appoint someone else as king, it makes you a little leery around the person of Abner, and you're thinking, wow, I'm not quite sure that this is a person who is trustworthy. Abner was a person who had great strengths and weaknesses. I think you could say that he had the good and the bad. In terms of Abner's strengths, well, he became an excellent military general, and not only did he lead and guide the forces of the nation, but we see that he became a huge political powerhouse. He was so highly energetic, he could make things happen. There's a lot of strengths that Abner had, but uh, he also had some weaknesses, and one that we see that was probably the most difficult was this, is that he selectively chose when he wanted to follow God's will and when he didn't want to follow God's will. And he's the one who made Esbosheth the king of the northern tribes. And so here's what the text just said. During this time period, David's power and strength, it is greatly increasing. At the same time, the house of Saul under Esbosheth, it is starting to wane and decline. And what we understand is that Abner, although he was a great political powerhouse, he did not have enough strength to keep the house of Saul strong. That was not what he was able to do. And the text goes on in verse 6, and it says this. Now, during the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner had been strengthening his own position in the house of Saul. Well, the emphasis of that is Abner is growing in might, and influence, and he is working on strengthening the influence that he has inside the country. Now, here's what the text didn't say. The text didn't say that during this time, Esbosheth, the king, was strengthening his position. No, while Esbosheth is declining, Abner is rising to preeminence, and I bet there's somebody who noticed that. I bet that that did not escape Esbosheth's awareness that Abner is growing in importance. And I bet there were times in which Esbosheth was advised, you better not go crossways with Abner, because if you do, you're going to pay a great price. Abner is elevating himself to be somewhat of a competition for the house of Saul and the throne of Esbosheth. And so trouble is coming, and Abner's this lightning rod within the whole kingdom of the north of Esbosheth, and we find in the next verse that lightning truly does strike. It says this. Now Saul had had a concubine named Rizpah, daughter of Aya. And Esbosheth said to Abner, Why did you sleep with my father's concubine? Now, <clears throat> when we read this text in verse 7, it raises some questions, and some of them will go unanswered. But there is an accusation that comes from the king to Abner that says, man, you have just pulled off an insidious political move. What he said is this, is that my king, key general, who is growing in political power, is shacking up with my father's concubine. I think there's two ways you can look at that. You could say, well, when the king died, Saul died, I guess Rispa is free to, uh, to get married and, and to, to be with somebody else, and that would be the case. But tell you, it's more complicated than that because 
if the key general of great political power begins to spend time with somebody who was formerly part of the household of Saul, that has huge political ramifications. You see, had they happened to have offspring together, many people would say, well, Rizpah was part of the house of Saul, and that means that the descendants of Abner and Rizpah, they would be, well, they would be in competition for the throne. If Abner was doing this, this would have been a clear move saying that he wanted to increase his political power in the nation in yet another way. And so Esbosheth the king says, I am shocked and appalled at this move which would increase your power. Now, the text doesn't really clarify whether or not this is but an accusation or whether it actually happened. But what is true is that this becomes such a bone of contention between the two great powers of the nation that it will generate political instability in the northern kingdom. So I think that when we're looking at this person by the name of Abner, we have to say, boy, is that guy a mixed bag. I mean, he's the guy who can put Esbosheth on the throne, but he's also the guy who can threaten Esbosheth's position on the throne. Abner's looking like a guy who could be really good or could be really bad, and in fact, he might oscillate back and forth between the two. The text continues, and Abner was very angry because of what Esbosheth said. He answered, Am I a dog's head on Judah's side? This very day I am loyal to the house of your father Saul and to his family and friends. I haven't handed you over to David, yet now you accuse me of an offense involving this woman. There are several key observations to the text, and I think the first one is this. Abner, in his response to the king, he is clearly angry. But you know what? Abner never clearly denies the accusation. He simply says, I'm upset by it. I'm insulted that you would bring it up. But he never fully denies it. And I wonder if the author of 2 Samuel is not leaving a door open to suggest maybe, maybe Abner was misbehaving himself. But then Abner does something which is absolutely strange. And I I want us to consider how strange this is. Abner gives himself an extremely odd compliment. He sort of says this. He says, hey, do you know what? Esbosheth, I've been so faithful to you and to your father's household that I have not yet turned you over to David, your adversary. That is a very strange compliment. I'd like to try to put that in our vernacular. Could you imagine a situation in which our chief joint of staff, chairman of the joint chiefs of staff, would say to the United States of America, Mr. President, I am so faithful to you that I have not yet turned you over to the Iranians or to the Russians or to the Chinese. You can pick who you think might be the greatest adversary. I am so faithful to you that I have not done that yet. Well, here's what I think would be the case if uh, Joint Chiefs were to say that. It would light up our evening news like no other comment ever had, and people would call that the most idiotic thing they had ever heard from a Joint Chiefs. But but is that not what Abner says? Abner says, Esbosheth, I am so faithful to you that I haven't yet given you over to David. Why in the world would you ever say something like that? And is there not in those words a veiled threat that I actually could be in a position in which I would do that to you. Who is this man, Abner, who speaks to a king with these words? Story goes on. Abner says, May God deal with Abner, be it ever so severely, if I do not do for David what the Lord promised him in an oath, and transfer the kingdom of the house of Saul, and establish David's throne over Israel, and Judah from Dan to Beersheba. Esbosheth did not dare to say another word to Abner because he was afraid of him. So the accusation that Esbosheth brought took Abner to a boiling point and he boils over. And I think what we see in this text are several important observations. Abner confesses in this text that he actually believes that God appointed David. He actually says that, well, you know what? I'm not just aware that David was anointed, but now I agree that God had chosen him. Wow, what a confession, Abner. 
And why now, after all of these years of being East Bashef's general, are you making a big U-turn and telling your king, actually, the other guy is the rightful king to the throne? Why, why now? I think at a minimum, it's because Abner got his feelings hurt. And I think that it might be because he sees that David's power is increasing and Ishbosheth's power is decreasing. And he's thinking it might be time for me to jump ship because that other ship is looking a whole lot better than the one that I'm on right now. I think that there's some great selfishness in what Abner is saying and what he's about to do. And then finally, Abner continues to operate as a kingmaker. And what Abner says to Esbesheth is this, just the way that I have made you king so I could make David king, and that is the great arrogance of Abner. He thinks that he is so powerful that he can appoint a king when he wants to. Now, if it's not clear, I don't really like Abner very much. I don't like the way that he flaunts his power. I don't like the way that he puts one king up and then turns against him. I don't think that he's a person that could be trusted. And clearly the text says that Esbosheth, the king of the north, was afraid of him and felt like he could do nothing. He had far less power than what Abner had. But Abner makes his move. When I think about the move that he makes, it's based on this phrase right here, that dangerous thinking makes a dangerous man. And Abner is convinced that he can raise up kings and he can remove kings. And so he makes a move to do that very thing. Verse 12, then Abner sent messages on his behalf to say to David, he's now approaching the adversary, the other kingdom that he's been at war with. And he starts out his communication by saying this, Whose land is it? Make an agreement with me, and I will help you bring all Israel over to you. Whose land is it? Abner's saying, that topic is up for grabs. It looks like it's East Besheth's land, but I'm not sure that it's East, East Besheth's land. How about you make an agreement with me, and I will transfer over to you the vast majority of the territory of Israel. I can do that for you, bud. Now ponder from David's perspective, if you would. He's been promised by God that he is to lead all of Israel. He's been waiting for the moment. And now there's somebody who comes and says, guess what? Without great bloodshed, rather smoothly and painlessly, I can work with you so that you receive all of the lands that are your due. How about you work with me and I will give you what it is that is right. Well, I think from David's point of view, he would have to go, wow, there'd be a real upside to this. Without bloodshed, without pain, I could become the king of all of that. And I'm sure that that sounded pretty good. And so Abner is offering something good from a heart that I don't think is very good. Boy, this man is a mixed bag. And so what we have in this story, the heart of the story, is this, that Abner offers David a peaceful way by which David can reunite the kingdom. Well, I could say, who wouldn't want that? I mean, on the one hand, he can give the kingdom and say, I'll give it to you peacefully, I'll give it to you in unity, and we can all be the people of God under your leadership the way that God wants. On the one hand, that's the case, but with Abner, I think the great, great question is, and what's in the other hand, Abner? And what's going to be the cost of this, Abner? And just the way that you turned your back on Ishbosheth, will you do that to David? Are you maneuvering for a special place in the new kingdom? I see Abner as being an incredibly mixed bag. How does David respond? David responds by saying, good, said David. I will make an agreement with you, but I demand one thing of you. Do not come into my presence unless you bring Michal, daughter of Saul, when you, when you come to see me. Then David sent messengers to Esbosheth, son of Saul, demanding, Give me my wife Michal, whom I betrothed to myself for the price of a hundred Philistine foreskins. Now, I think that what we have in these verses is David's going to test the political power and strength of Abner. 
And there's two sides to this story. There's a family side to the story and there's a political side to the story. Well, the family side to this story is David has been so hurt by King Saul. King Saul would not let his daughter, his, David's wife, go with them. He broke that relationship and did worse than that. He said that Mikael ought to marry someone else and way overstepped his bounds when he did that. That's the family side of this story and David would like to be with his wife again. There's a political side to this story. For you see, if Abner can deliver Mikkel, he will show just how powerful he is because there's multiple reasons why Ishbosheth wouldn't want Mikkel to end up back with David. First, it would show weakness on David's part. His father was so strong and such a bully, he could separate them and David couldn't do anything about it. Mikkel goes back to David. Ishbosheth's not looking as powerful. But much more than that, if David and Ishbosheth have a child, that child would be heir both to the throne of Saul and to the throne of David. And that would unite those kingdoms the way that nothing else ever could. And so for Ishbosheth, if Mikkel goes over and that results in a future, then his children probably would no longer rule the nation. This has huge political overtones to it. And the question is, Abner... Are you so powerful that you could make this happen? Is that how much influence you have in the territory? And the text goes like this. So Ishbosheth gave orders and had her, Mikkel, taken away from her husband, Paltiel, son of Laish. And her husband, however, went with her, weeping behind her all the way to Bahurim. Then Abner said to him, go back home. So he went home. I'd like for you to notice in this text that Abner is part of the company whereby Mikkel is delivered to David. The text is trying to say that Abner has success. He escorts Mikkel back to David, and in doing so, he demonstrates that he can absolutely deliver. Here, there is an upside to Abner. He is a powerful politician. There is a downside. He thinks that he is the kingmaker. There's an upside. He can return David's wife. Here there's an upside. He says, I can orchestrate the transfer of power. There's a downside because Abner has turned his back on Ishbosheth and has shown that he is not totally faithful. And so depending on what aspect of Abner you're looking at, you might have two different opinions. Some would say, well, if Abner can give you the, 12, the 11 tribes of, of Israel, let's make it person of the year. Who wouldn't want that? Abner, the man who inflamed the problem by helping Ishbosheth become ruler in the first place. And so Abner keeps showing his upside, verse 17. And Abner conferred with the elders of Israel and said, For some time you have wanted to make David your king because they saw that David's getting more powerful and Ishbosheth isn't. You want this. Now do it. For the Lord promised David, by my servant, I will rescue my people, Israel, from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of their enemies. And what we see in this text is Abner throws all of his political weight into this. He says to the people, let's go ahead, let's pull the trigger. And in doing so, Abner becomes the spearhead of a political coup in which he is going to transfer all of the land and the people from Ishbosheth into the hands of David. We're going to see just how powerfully political this man is. What sort of political shrewdness does Abner have? And I think that at this point it would be good for us to look inside of Abner and make a key observation for this is what I believe we see in the man. When God's will agreed with Abner's will, Abner is more than happy to talk about God's will. Now, back in the day when Abner thought that he would do better with Ishbosheth than with David, he had nothing to do with God's will. But now that he sees that David would be a better king, he's like, well, God wanted David to be king. I could agree with that because you know what? That would make me more powerful. I'm, I'm really all about me and I'm about my power. I think that Abner was living with a priority of the kingdom of, of me. And so Abner goes all the way and flexes his muscles. Abner also spoke to the Benjaminites in person. That was the tribe of Saul, the ones who would have been closest to Saul. 
And then he went to Hebron to tell David everything that Israel and the whole tribe of Benjamin wanted to do. And when Abner, who had 20 men with him, came to David at Hebron, David prepared a feast for him and his men. And then Abner said to David, let me go at once and assemble all Israel for my Lord and King so that they may make a covenant with you and that you may rule over all that your heart desires. David, I can make it happen. And Abner's great claim is this, the man who made Esbosheth king makes David an offer. He says, I can do the exact same thing for you. And in doing so, Abner places himself as the central figure in the transfer of power. I think that's one of the key parts of this whole text. Abner places himself as the key person in the transfer of power. He's saying, I am this important, and therefore he is that powerful. And therefore, I think what we have in Abner is a classic example of somebody who is interested at this moment in doing the right thing for the wrong reason. I think the reason that Abner wants to do it is because he sees that there's personal benefits in it. I think that he sees that he's part of a sinking ship. And so at this moment, he is ready to follow God's will. And I think the message that we have from this story is this. It doesn't only matter what happens, but how it happens really matters. You see, it doesn't just matter that David is going to become the king of Israel. It matters how he's going to become the king of Israel. And, and God has never said that the kingdom will come from the hand of a man, or from somebody who's shrewd in politics, from a guy by the name of Abner. He said that the kingdom will come from his hand. It doesn't just matter what happens. It matters how it happens. It doesn't just matter that you and I are happy. It matters what's producing the happiness in our lives. It doesn't just matter that we might find ourselves living comfortably. It matters how we came about the financial resources that can enable that to be the case. It doesn't just matter that we ended up where we wanted to at the top of our game. It, it matters how we got there and in the process do we have any friends that understand that we care and that we love them and that actually call us people of character and honor. It doesn't just matter what happens, it matters how it happens. And Abner was never called to be a king maker. And it would be a great mistake for Abner to be the person who makes David king over all of Israel. It doesn't just matter what happens, it matters how it happens. But boy, I tell you, on this day, Abner sure looks like he's got an upside. He's showing up with the 11 tribes of Israel on a silver platter saying, David, I got it all worked out for you. I'm going to give it to you and you can have what you want, just not how God wanted it to take place. And we see this theme in Abner's life. When God's will agreed with Abner's will, Abner is more than happy to do it. But I think what was true also in Abner's life is when God's will didn't agree with Abner's will, Abner wanted nothing at all to do with God's will. And it makes me ponder, do I have moments in which I find myself a little bit akin to Abner? It's kind of a discouraging thing. But I think that it's very possible, and I think that I could graph it this way. You see, there is my will, and in my will, there are certain things that I want, and there is the will of God as well. And every once in a while, there might be a convenient intersection between the two. And I think that I need to ask myself the question, and maybe we all need to ask ourselves the question, is, is this. Is my primary devotion to the Lord really found exclusively where there is this crossroads between my will and God's will, and we both just sort of happen to want the same thing? And, and if we get outside that intersection, do I find that I am far less devoted to my great king? If so, I'd find myself a little bit like Abner, and I would be saying I'm very interested in the Lord as long as, well, it's feeding uh, the kingdom of me. God desires for something very different to happen. Yeah, there are convenient places in which 
our will and God's will intersect. But God doesn't want those occasions to be few and far between and for our devotion to only be at those seldom moments when there's an intersection. As as we work with the Lord and serve Him and learn about Him, He has a great desire that something would change within our very will. So that slowly and surely, step by step, as we fall in love with Him, as we read His Word, as His Spirit works in our lives, that, that our will would be transformed to be what God wants, and that we would find ourselves wanting what God wants constantly, and that is precisely what I don't see ever happening in the life of Abner. And so I think this text tells us that we should beware of a man by the name of Abner, because it matters not only what happens, but it matters how it happens. And Abner wanted to bring to David the right thing, but I'm going to suggest that he wanted to bring it to David in the wrong way. Not only matters what happens, but it surely matters how it happens. I like to take that principle and I'd like to apply it to what we do here at Treasure Lake Church. It, it matters not just what happens, but it matters how it happens. And So when I think about the what needs to happen at church, well, we're part of the what right now because we want to study God's Word, and so that we study God's Word is great, but how we study God's Word, it's going to be vital, and so we need to make sure that as we study God's Word that we're studying the easy passages and the hard passages, we're studying both. As we study God's Word, we need to study those texts which affirm those things that we're doing, and we're doing very well, and we're encouraged. We need to study the texts that tell us we are far from the mark and there's so much that we need to improve. We, we need to study the texts that seem to irritate no one in our society today and we definitely must study the texts that do irritate where our society and our culture are going. It matters not only what we do, but it matters how we do it. And as we struggle to do the right thing and to do it well, I certainly would hope that you would be having a voice uh, in that topic saying, hey, Dave, I care about how it's done. I'll, I'm even willing to give you my feedback. As, as we do what is right, we want to do it in the way that it should be done. And so when we get together, we worship the Lord and we sing. That's a what. And we lift up his name and, and we sing to him. But, but how we do it really matters. And it's vital that we don't just sing, but that we find ourselves connecting with God and actually singing to him, not just singing music. And as we interact with our Father and as we worship him and as we touch and experience his glory, our souls are invigorated. It is not just the what, but it's the how we do it. Father, would you please, please help us to do this the way that you want us to do. And if we're off the mark, would you please coach us as we're working with the next generation, a very important what that we do, Vacation Bible School. It's not just important what we do, but it's important how we do it. And last week, I'm very thankful I I had some people coach me on how I could have done my part better than what I did. And I'm very thankful that they shared what they shared because it's true. I could have done it better than what I did, and I'm thankful for people who care about how things are being done. It matters not just what we are doing, but it matters how we are doing it. I'd like to share two thoughts with you on that topic as it relates to Treasure Lake Church. And the first would be this. Um, Sometimes as you take a look at what we're doing and how we're doing it and you see that things could be better, I'd like for you to to realize one thing. It could be that uh, sometimes we're kind of missing the mark, not because we have great convictions about missing the mark. We're we're just trying to, to grow and get better and, and talk and share and coach us up and work with us so that we do it better and better. And please do feel like your voice is important because together we will grow with the Lord. It matters not just what we do, but it matters how we are doing it. It matters how we live this life and how we navigate this world in which we bump into people and policies and practices that are a mixed bag they have both good and bad in them and they're difficult to work with for Abner certainly looked like he had an upside but he had all sorts of downsides if if it was only downsides it would have been so much easier to deal with Abner you know the story ends up not being less complex it ends up being more complex if you read through the end of chapter three what you're going to see is that Abner's eliminated 
by somebody else who's a mixed bag. He's, uh, his name is Joab. And while I think that Abner should not have had success, I don't believe at all that Abner's life should have ended the way that it did. It, it ended because there was somebody else that David knew that was a mixed bag. And I think these stories tell us that uh, we're not the only people who live in these complex worlds of people who sometimes get it right and sometimes do terrible things. And, and I think that what we learn throughout all of these stories is this great principle. And it is that God is at work not only despite these things, but he is at work through these things. And despite the fact that David was surrounded by people who were mixed bags, he found himself calling out to the Lord and saying, Lord, help me to live correct and righteous. And on this occasion, David did make some good decisions. And it wasn't that all the mixed bags just disappeared. He uh, worked to pursue the Lord in the midst of a life that is full of the mixed bag. I think that we need to pray for discernment and say, Father, help me. I live in a world that oftentimes is a mixed bag with people who are mixed bag and policies and situations. And Father, would you please give me wisdom as I navigate it and help me to not just get the what down, but to get the how down so that it's done as you would want. I think that that's one of the messages of chapter 3 of 2 Samuel. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that the day did come that David became the ruler of the 12 tribes of Israel as you promised. We're glad that your prediction, the what, came about and we're thankful to Heavenly Father that it didn't come about simply because Abner, through political shrewdness, pursued something where his will and yours overlapped conveniently. Heavenly Father, it matters not just what happens, but how it happens. And so we bring ourselves to you and we pray, Father, would you help us to get down what's right both in the what and in the how. Lord, coach us on how we can worship you in spirit and truth, how we can love you the way that you have asked us to love you. Lord, teach us to serve people and to serve them as they need to be served. We care deeply about the what and the how and we ask that you work in this whole community so that we become more and more the community that you desire. All of these things we pray in the name of Jesus, our precious Lord and Savior. Amen. At the first of the month, we enjoy stopping and saying, Lord, you've asked us to do something. You've asked us to do something in remembrance of you. You've asked that we'd gather around what is the, the Lord's table and to celebrate communion in which we remember the great, great things that Jesus has done for us. We have a Savior. His work is done on the cross. He defeated sin. He rose again from the dead. He's given us new life, and our Savior says, would you please remember my work in that, that it was based on what he did, the true Son of God, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sins of the world. When the Apostle Paul was interacting with people that he deeply loved and cared about, he wrote these words, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take this, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so it's our pleasure to stop and for us to say, yes, Lord, we'll do that. And we're going to remember that your body was broken for us. Your, your sacrifice was complete. It was anguishing on the cross, and yet it shows your love for us. Let's pray. Father God, we stop to remember that the cross changes everything. Jesus, we stop to remember you and to celebrate you. We thank you that the love that you have shown us is powerful and it is great. We worship you and all of our faith is in you. There is but one Savior. His name is Jesus. And we remember what you've done for us on the cross. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat. The text goes on and it shares these words and in the same manner he also took the cup when he had supped saying this cup is the new covenant of my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me 
And so as we think about what Christ did on the cross, his body was broken and his blood was shed. And there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And it took a perfect Savior to come and to die for us and take away our sins. We're so thankful for what he's done. And let's thank him right now. Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much that you gave all. Thank you that your blood is shed and that we are washed whiter than snow. Lord, we confess that uh, we need to be washed by you whiter than snow. There is no hope of us achieving that on our own. We're thankful that as you take our sin, that you give us your righteousness, that you clothe us in something totally different, and you've given us a place with you. We know that this could only happen because of what you have done, and we thank you for the grace that you have given us so that we can be part of your body. We celebrate your work on the cross. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. As often as we do this, we celebrate something. We celebrate what Jesus did on the cross, and we will celebrate it until he comes, and that will be a glorious, glorious day.